were buried according to their religious denomination. As we stand here, uh, I'm going to, to show you the, the grave of Sir Matthew Bailey Begbie. Sir Matthew Bailey Begbie was the Chief Justice of British Columbia um, after the big gold rush of 1858. And Begbie lived in Victoria, but of course he traveled uh, extensively through the province. And there's a very important case that was featured in the book, Go Do Some Great Thing by Crawford Killian, still the, the key work for the history of black people in British Columbia. And I'd just like to read a couple of excerpts from that book. And it involves a court case. The Aurora claim, the Aurora Company in Barkerville was having a dispute with the Davis Company, um, basically over who owned a particular claim. The Davis Company uh, was actually operated and owned by people who were black miners and some who were white miners. They seemed to get along very well. But along came the Aurora Company and claimed that they had staked it first. And it's a very complicated case, but basically it came before Judge Begbie uh, in the court at Richfield near Barkerville, and he made a ruling that was very, very controversial at the time. He basically gave the lion's share to the Aurora Company, leaving the Davis Company with a very small share. And this, you can imagine, did not sit very well with the people in the Davis Company. And although there are people who say that Begbie was being fair and that he was uh, using his judicial wisdom, there are others, including Crawford Killian, who think otherwise, that Begbie made his decision in favor of the Aurora Company, that is the white company, because the Davis Company had a large number of black people involved. And as the situation unfolded in Barkerville, there were community meetings and many people there believed that uh, Begbie was very wrong. And uh, it came down to a number of people going to New Westminster, to the colonial administrator, and they had some specific questions to ask him. First, have we as colored men the right to preempt ground for mining purposes? Second, have we any rights in common with white men? Third, why were our interests taken from us and given to white men? And so this was presented to the uh, person in New Westminster who really had no power to overturn Begbie's decision. So this is one small example of disputes that arose in the early days. And we know that there were at least 50 black miners in the Barkerville area. This is one dispute that set them and their white uh, colleagues apart, certainly in the eyes of Sir Matthew Bailey Begbie. Now, I'd like to leave Begbie's grave and we'll walk over this way, continuing through the Anglican section. And we'll be passing some of the graves of people uh, known very well by Sir Matthew Bailey Begbie. Uh, just over here, the grave of Begbie's very close personal friend, Peter O'Reilly. Some of you might know him because Point Alice House, the family home, is now a historic site. But we're coming over to the grave of the Creese family. Sir Henry Perring Pellew Creese. Uh, became one of the justices of the Supreme Court, along with Begbie. But I'd like to talk about him before he was Sir Matthew. And we're looking at his grave right here. Let me just make sure I've got it pointed in the right direction. Okay, there we are. There's the grave of Sir Matthew Bailey. No, my apologies. This is the grave of Sir Henry Perring Pellew Creese. There are too many knighthoods involved here. And the Grave is a very important one because in 1860, Henry Kreese was asked to look after a case, a very special case here in Victoria, and it involved a runaway slave. I'm going to turn you back to the view so that you can actually see the grave and not me. It was a, a boy by the name of Charlie Mitchell. Charlie Mitchell was born in the area around Chesapeake Bay. 
Charlie was a slave. His mother was a slave. Uh, Charlie's father, as far as we know, was a white man, an oysterman from Chesapeake Bay. The family that owned Charlie uh, did not do so well financially, and eventually the boy was given to a relative, James Tilton, who became a hero, at least uh, depending on whose point of view you have, uh, in the Mexican War. And Tilton agreed that he would look after Charlie, the idea being that he would give Charlie his freedom when Charlie was 18. That didn't happen, however. And Charlie was in Olympia, where Major Tilton uh, was the Surveyor General for the new Washington Territory. And one day, Charlie stowed away on board a, a steamer, the Eliza Anderson, a side wheeler that plied regularly between Puget Sound ports and Victoria. Charlie had heard from the black steward on board the boat that he could hide in the kitchen, in the pantry, and that when he reached Victoria, of course, because Victoria was part of the British Empire, Charlie would no longer be a slave, slavery having been abolished in the British Empire in the 1830s. Charlie did this, but bad luck followed him because in the end, there was a, a man who had escaped from the army in Puget Sound and the American authorities entered the boat, not looking for Charlie or runaway slaves, but looking for the fugitive from the army. They found Charlie, of course, and Charlie was locked up in the brig. And when they reached Victoria, he was gonna stay there. But some of the black people on board rushed to shore and said, things are not working out as we'd planned. See, this was a, an aspect of the Underground Railroad. And so they went to Mr. Crease, a lawyer on Government Street. Crease issued a writ of habeas corpus. And the following day, there was a trial before the Chief Justice of Vancouver Island, David Cameron. And Crease explained the situation. And to cut a long story short, Cameron simply said, what's the argument? Doesn't matter how Charlie got here. We are on British soil. There is no slavery on British soil. Case dismissed. Charlie has been free ever since he arrived here. It's an interesting situation. Of course, the people that were uh, responsible for looking after the boat were not happy. They were hoping to take Charlie back and get a reward from Major Tilton. Uh, in Olympia, but that never happened. Charlie remained here. And although it's uncertain, really, what happened to Charlie, we believe he did stay here. And sometime in the mid 1870s, um, he was drowned in a horrible accident, uh, bringing a load of lumber from Souk to Victoria. Although we'll never know for sure, there's a possibility that that was not the Charlie Mitchell that uh, was so involved in the case I just talked about. But that case, it's actually an important one because it was the only case we know of where the Underground Railroad actually worked here in what is now British Columbia. I'm just going to put you back on the view to see where we're going. And as we go down this way, we're heading to the, the grave of Captain Jeremiah Nagel. Nagel was Irish and Nagel had a steamboat, the Commodore. And the Commodore plied back and forth regularly, about every 10 days or so between San Francisco and Puget Sound, stopping at Victoria on the way. And in the winter of 1858, leading into the spring, Nagel, uh, who was in Victoria, discussed with James Douglas the plight of black people in California. I'm just going to show you the grave of Jeremiah Nagel right here. Jeremiah Nagel came back to Victoria and said that the black people in California were being persecuted. Although California ostensibly was a free state, the blacks there were under increasing pressure. They were told that they could no longer send their children to the public schools. Of course, based on the Dred Scott decision by the US Supreme Court, Blacks throughout the United States were not even deemed to be citizens. And some interpreted that as they were not even allowed to be considered people. Horrendous, horrendous decisions. But enough was enough. And when a young boy um, escaped from his master, the boy's name was Archie Lee, 
and a, a court case ruled that Archie really was free. Well, they were worried that this was going to be a very difficult situation for other blacks. And so there was a meeting and they were going to decide what to do. Should they leave en masse? Should they go to Panama? Should they go to Mexico? Should they come to British territory here on Vancouver Island? Remember at the time, Vancouver Island and British Columbia were still, uh, British Columbia had not even started as a colony. It was only Vancouver Island. Nagel must have discussed this with James Douglas, who himself was of black ancestry. And Douglas, who was obliged to bring settlers to Vancouver Island, said, yes, they can come here. Please go back and invite them. And that's precisely what Nagel did. He arrived at a meeting at the Zion African Methodist Episcopal Church in San Francisco. While they were discussing the plight of Archie Lee, Nagel arrived and presented an invitation from James Douglas to come here and told them the wonders of Vancouver Island and that they would be free. They could own land, they could vote, all the things they could not do down there. And so about 600 of them arrived. The first ones coming at the end of April, 1858, they were aboard the Commodore, Captain Nagel in charge. So the first black people arrived en masse, maybe 600 of them in the end of April, 1858, more followed. Uh, many of them stayed in Victoria, some went to the gold fields. It turns out that their arrival coincided with the beginning of the gold rush. They did not know that there was going to be a gold rush, although for many of them it was a, an opportunity for them to earn a little bit more money. But many stayed in Victoria. They were going to be carpenters, farmers, tinsmiths, whatever trade they had, they would ply here. And in the end, uh, many of them remained. Some of them moved away to other places, of course. Now, we've arrived at the grave of Isabella Roth, sorry, Rebecca Gibbs. Rebecca Gibbs. You might be familiar with the last name Gibbs because her brother-in-law, Mifflin Wistar Gibbs, is a very important figure, not only in Canadian history, but in American history as well. The Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada has declared that Mifflin Wistar Gibbs is a national historic figure. There's a plaque to him in Victoria to that effect. But let's talk about Rebecca. Like Mifflin, she was born in Philadelphia. She was born free, of course. She had attended one of the schools, probably operated by Quakers. And she came here with her husband, Richard Gibbs. But unfortunately, Richard Gibbs died. And Rebecca and her mother-in-law, Maria Gibbs, and possibly another Gibbs brother, moved to Barkerville. And there, uh, uh, Rebecca... Valen is here, John. Good, okay. I'll, 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 I'll just finish the story since I've, I'm halfway through it, and then, uh, Valen, you can, you can join in for your next one after that. Okay. And Rebecca was a laundress, a poet, and a nurse and ended up coming down to Victoria where she died. And actually, Valen, since you are now on, let me go around to the reverse side of the grave because I know this is one of your favorite stories. And <laughs> I've told the story of Rebecca Gibbs. Uh, she was a literate person. Her poems were published in the Caribou Sentinel, the newspaper that was published in Barkerville. And I've gone to the other side of the grave and here on this monument that was put up by the BC Black History Awareness Society, in conjunction with the Old Cemetery Society, we have inscribed the poem, The Old Red Shirt. Sure. Valen, are, are you there? And can you, can you read it for us, please? Yes, I can do that. A miner came to my cabin door. His clothes, they were covered with dirt. He held out a piece he desired me to wash, which I found was an old red shirt. His cheeks were thin and furrowed his brow. His eyes, they were shut in his head. He said he had just got work and would be able to earn his bread. He said that the garment was torn and asked me to give it a stitch. 
but found it was thoroughly worn, which proved he was not very rich. Oh, miners with good paying claims. Oh, traders who wish to do good. Have pity on men who earn you wealth and begrudge not the poor miner his food. Far from the mountains a poor mother mourns, the darling that hung by her skirt. When contentment and plenty surrounded the home of the miner that brought me that church. And we suspect that Rebecca Gibbs might have been um, someone who had some social philosophy concerns for the poor. And um, we know this because of her interest in joining Canada at the, at the Confederation and with her treatment with sick people, she was a nurse and so on. So we suspect Rebecca was very social minded. Donna, John? Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you, Vettel. I'm glad you were able to join us for that because well, I, well, I know that uh, we've been doing these tours together for decades, it seems. And I know the old red shirt is one of your favorites uh, yeah. to include on the tour. So good time for you to join in. Well, and, uh, uh, sorry. Yes. You go on. I'm sorry we were having a lot of trouble that we didn't understand what was happening. Thank God my daughter is a, a little bit of a techie and was able to sort it out. Sorry you're, not the only, you're not the only one that is technically challenged. I think that would probably be, include me and many others viewing too, perhaps. But right now, let's uh, continue on and we'll have a walk down this way. There was a grave that I discovered quite recently, and it's sort of on the way to the next grave that we were going to talk about, and that is the grave of Sir James Douglas. So let me take a very slight detour, take you to the grave of Mrs. Isabella Tilton. If uh, that sounds familiar, uh, Isabella Tilton was the widow of Major James Tilton. Remember the story of Charlie Mitchell, well, Major Tilton was the one who was Charlie's master. It was from Major Tilton and Isabella that Charlie ran away. Well, Major Tilton died and Isabella, in her later years, moved up to Victoria, where one of her sons, Edward, was a member of the well-known uh, hardware company called Marvin and Tilton down on Wharf Street near Bastion Square. And exactly why they came and exactly why Isabella came up to join him, I don't know. Let me just show you the grave very, very briefly. Here it is, Isabella Tilton. And when Charlie joined the Tilton household, um, he was really just a boy. And Isabella, I'm sure, uh, was the one who fed and clothed Charlie to some extent. And I suspect well, who knows what her reactions would have been when they discovered that Charlie had run away and come here, but you can imagine that they probably weren't very happy. It's rather ironic that she came here uh, to spend her final days, and whether or not um, she knew what had happened to Charlie, I don't know. But I'm sure there were many people in Victoria who remembered the story of Charlie Mitchell and how his, uh, uh, his trial before the Chief Justice um, really had been a very important aspect of uh, Victoria's history. Whether Isabella ever talked about that, who knows. So just an aside, as we head this way, uh, we've been joined by a couple of other people who are out enjoying the, the beautiful Sunday in the cemetery. And we're walking along the main carriageway here. And all the graves that we've included so far we're in the Anglican section, but as we look over this way, we're 
looking into the Presbyterian section, another very large and prominent part of the cemetery. And although James Douglas was not a Presbyterian, at least as far as we know, perhaps his father had been, but James Douglas uh, was a practicing Anglican. But when he died in 1877, maybe special provisions were made for him to be in really what is the most prominent section of the cemetery right here. This huge red granite a, a column with the cross on top is the grave for Sir James, whose name is emblazoned on the left-hand side, and his wife, Lady Douglas, whose name is on the right-hand side. It's important to include Sir James Douglas and Lady Douglas as well, and we do so on many of our tours for different reasons. Lady Douglas was Métis, and we've included her story many times, but today is Black history is our topic, and Sir James definitely was of Black ancestry. His father was Scottish from Glasgow, but Douglas definitely was black. And uh, I'm not sure that Douglas uh, would have openly talked about that. We really don't know because he didn't write about that. Although it was very clear to everybody who saw him that his skin was darker and his hair was perhaps blacker and more curly than, than many people from Scotland. And he was listed in the Hudson's Bay Company records as a mulatto or a Scotch West Indian. Uh, terms that were used at the time. Douglas, it seems, did not hide his ancestry, um, but at the same time, um, even his children were rather unclear about the ancestry. And so uh, later on, after Douglas's death, uh, some of the children, or at least their children, were surprised when they discovered that the Black ancestry did exist in the family. Of course, at one time, uh, for some people, that would have been something to hide. Today, it's not, hopefully, but indeed, uh, it was something that everybody probably knew about, but Douglas did not talk about it openly. Did it affect his governorship? Well, I don't believe so. I wrote Douglas's biography, and although Douglas in some ways was pompous and autocratic and annoyed a number of people because of his high-handed ways, I did not come across any references to Douglas being criticized for who he was as a person. The fact that Douglas was black was never mentioned in the criticisms of him. His wife's being Métis was indeed mentioned in a negative way, but Douglas's black ancestry was not mentioned. If any of you are aware of any specific references that I have missed, I would really like to know. But indeed, there are lots of criticisms of Douglas, but not because of his black heritage. Now, Valen, we have reached uh, the grave site of Sydney Francis, and uh, there is really no marker on this grave, but we know she's here because of the burial records. And uh, she was the daughter of the Dandridge family. And I wonder if you could tell us about them, please. The, the Dandridge house. In 20... 14, the BC Black History Awareness Society assisted in unveiling of a heritage home at 1243 Rudland Street here in Victoria. This was the climax of a fantastic piece of detective work by David McMinn and Linda Carlson, current owners of the house now known as Dandridge House, which was built in 1861. It was first located at the northwestern corner of Johnson and Vancouver streets, but moved to Rudlin when the city expanded. It is perhaps the only example of a black pioneer's home still existing in Victoria. The first owners of this house were John and Charlotte Dandridge. John seemed to have been born in Virginia sometime in the 1780s. His wife, Charlotte, was born in New Jersey in 1793. The Dandridge were among the 700 black families 
who came to Victoria in 1858 at the invitation of Governor James Douglas. John Dandridge applied for citizenship in 1858 and took the oath of allegiance in 1860. He then seemed to have disappeared and might have returned to the USA at the end of the Civil War. John's wife, Charlotte, however, died here in 1863 and is buried in the old burying ground at Quadra Street here in Victoria. That's the little story about Dandridge House. Thank you, Valen, for telling us the story. It is a very interesting house. And the, the grave site we were just looking at was the grave site of Sydney Dandridge, who married a man by the name of Abner Hunt Francis. They married in Buffalo, uh, went to Portland, and then came up here where the Dandridge family uh, welcomed them. Uh, Abner Hunt Francis, by the way, was the, uh, the first black person in British Columbia to be elected to a city council, although he was not able to serve his term, uh, basically on a technicality. That was in 1865. So the grave we were just looking at was the grave of Mrs. Francis, uh, who was a member of the Dandridge family. I'm going to uh, show you where we're walking right now. We're heading back down through the the Presbyterian section, but we're just about to cross the road here along this way, the Grand Avenue of Ross Bay Cemetery. And because we don't have a large group following us today, I'm going to cut across country here in the Methodist section. There are many black people buried here in the Methodist section and also in the adjacent, adjacent section, which we've included before on some of our tours, but we're not doing so today. Uh, many of the black people who came here in 1858 and 59, who might have been members of other churches, uh, churches that were considered to be black churches in the United States, did not do so here. They joined the established congregations and were welcomed into those congregations by some of the ministers who were here, notably Edward Cridge. But indeed, many were Methodists and are buried here in the Methodist section. As we're working our way down, there are many graves of black people in this section, and we'll be including several of them. But the first one I'd like to, to stop at is just up ahead. And although the grave has been here for a very, very long time, the marker on the grave is brand new. Not this one, but the little one right here. You can see perhaps that it's a, a different color. It's clean. And I'm going to get up a little bit closer so you can have a closer look at the grave of Harris Carter, Captain, Victoria Pioneer Rifle Corps, and his dates, 1820 to 1890. And his wife, Mary Carter, from 1826 to 1890. In fact, it's said that after Mary died in 1890, Harris died of a broken heart only two weeks later. So why does Paris Carter have this new gravestone put on by the last post society? Well, it's because he was in fact a member of and became the captain of the Victoria Pioneer Rifle Corps, sometimes uh, commonly called the African Rifles. They started in 1859 at the invitation of James Douglas, the governor, it seems that after they had arrived here, they were very civic minded, at least many of the black people were, and volunteered to join the fire brigade, the Union, Union Hook and Ladder Company. All the fire brigades in those days were volunteer. The problem was the people who had formed that were mostly from the United States and really were the people that many of the blacks were trying to get away from. And so they were denied entry. And when they went to Douglas and said, hold on, you said that we would be free here. And I'm not exactly sure what Douglas said, but presumably he has said, well, you are free now. You're not slaves. Not that they all were to begin with. You're owning land. You own buildings. Uh, you have businesses. Some of you are prospering. 
but because the Union Hook and Ladder Company was a volunteer and private company, he could do nothing about it officially. But the pig war on San Juan Island had just begun a rather silly skirmish involving a dispute over who owned the San Juan Islands. And he was worried that there was going to be war between the United States and Canada. And so he said, we have a Navy here, the Royal Navy, but we do not have an army. And he invited them to form the first militia unit here, the African Rifles. It seemed like a good idea at the time, but unfortunately it did not work out quite so well. It seems that although Douglas seemed to be in favor of this, the whole system wasn't able to provide the guns and other things that the, the soldiers needed. They did drill, but there were many disappointments, notably when in 1864, the new governor, Arthur Kennedy arrived to take over from Douglas and the black militia unit, which would have taken precedence over all the other uh, units such as the fire brigade and so on, was told that if they marched in the procession at the head of the procession where they should be, that some of the other units would not march behind them. And so the African rifles decided that they weren't going to make a fuss and they decided to stay away. That was one of their grievances and the following year uh, in disgust, the group was disbanded. Now we have reached the grave of somebody who actually had a very special role to play with the African Rifles. Uh, this is the grave of the Pointer family, William Pointer, who ran a clothing store. But Valen has a story about Sarah and Pointer, and I'm showing you her side of the grave here. So Valen, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks to you, John. Um, as you have heard, Governor James Douglas had welcomed Blacks to Victoria, but they were not all embraced by everyone and everywhere. At this grave site, and at the one with Nathan and Sarah Pointers, I shall mention two incidents that demonstrate that acceptance was not shared by all Victorians. The first incident took at the Victoria Theater. Nathan Pointer had been Mifflin Gibbs's first partner in San Francisco. Nathan and his wife, Sarah, were among the first blacks to arrive in Victoria. And Nathan opened a large clothing store here and prospered. In the fall of 1861, a benefit for the hospital was held at the Victoria Theater. Up until this time, many prosperous blacks had avoided the theater, but due to the nature of the benefit, they bought tickets for the concert. Rumors had circulated that any blacks in the dress cycle, in the, in the dress circle, the expensive seat would be pelted with onions and flour. In fact, one sh shopkeeper had given three onions to each customer on the day of the concert just for that purpose. Nathan Pointer and his young daughter attempted, attended and took the seats in the dress cycle just in front of the Gibbses. As the concert was ready to start, one of the performers refused to go on stage. And unless the blacks left the class, they dress cycle, circle. When they refused, the performer left the theater but the show did go on. Near the end of the concert, several whites came down the aisle and tossed a newspaper package of flour into the audience. It hit the pointer and a cloud of dust went over the Gibbses. A brief fight ensued, which was broken up by the police. 
In the court case that followed, no whites were charged, but Pointer was fined $5. After this, the theater would sell tickets to blacks only for, for, for the cheaper seats in the galleries. The black community petitioned Governor Douglas to reverse the practice, but Douglas did nothing. The actor <clears throat> who refused to perform that night was Emil Sutro. He explained his position in the colonists the following day. He said, I do not believe in any amalgamation of white and colored people, nor that I later should so socially intermix with the former. No sensible person will object, it, will object to the colored population being admitted to any public place of amusement but let one part of the house be reserved for the particular use. John has mentioned the African rifles and this story is what happens sometime to them. When James Douglas, as governor of Vancouver Island in 1864, he was replaced by Arthur Kennedy. A parade was planned to welcome the new governor and the African rifles expected to march in it. However, the organizers refused on the ground that as a military unit, they would march at the head of the parade and some of the white marchers, particularly members of the volunteer fire brigade would refuse to march behind them. In spite of the snub, the African rifles continued to drill and held a special ceremony shortly before Kennedy's arrival. At this time, the ladies of the black community presented a silk union jack to the unit. It was presented by Sarah Pointer, who made a speech for which this small, is a small extract. In presenting the flag, she said, I present to you this flag. It affords me great pleasure to do so. As we know, your loyalty to this government is proverbial. The fostering care it has shown to the oppressed of our race leaves us under many obligations to the sagacity and wisdom of a, state, of a statesman. Yet, in this far distant colony of Her Majesty's dominion, we have many causes to complain. True, you have not yet been called upon to rally under this flag for its protection. Yet the war of complexional distinction is upon us. But men, as long as this flag shall wave over you, you may rest assured that no man can successfully grind you down under the iron heel of oppression. It will inspire you in the hour of peril. It is a nation's proudest boast. It's a terror to a foe and a cap canopy of peace to a free man. On the, on the actual day of the parade, the African rifles did not march, but went instead to a restaurant near Beaton Hill Park 
and ate fried chicken and drank beer. Thank you, John. <laughs> so valid. Thank you very much. That, that's such a, a moving story. And we're not going very far right now. We're going to be heading over still within the old Methodist section. And I'm just going to turn you on the view so that you can see where we're going and head over that way. There are three graves close together. And many of the other black people buried in the section are scattered throughout, but the next three are close together. Perhaps they were friends. That often was the way people would be buried close to their friends. And the first grave is one that is not marked. Uh, the first grave is for a man whose last name was Lomax. And I'm just going to stand here and show you the, the space. <clears throat> and I'm going to read you the obituary of Mr. Lomax from the, the colonist. Died February 1893 in Victoria, BC. Old John Lomax, 98, as he was known almost since his arrival here in 1858. Deceased was born a slave in Virginia and thanks to an excellent memory, could tell the younger generation of happenings in the first days of the present century, that is the early 1800s. Had he been spared but two more years, he would have celebrated his 100th birthday. He left a considerable estate, a testimonial to his thrift, business ability, and frugal habits. As he remained single to his death, it is not yet, yet known who his heir is. And the list of pallbearers is really a list of some of the who's who of the black community. Charles Alexander, Stacy Kunis, Thomas Alexander, S. Whitney, Samuel Booth, and W.H. Wheeler. The will of the deceased gives property in and about Victoria totaling $10,000 to a half-brother on the old Virginia plantation. The old horse and wagon and $100 cash go to Kirk Jackson. Godfrey Kennel gets $100, and Mrs. Pierre Sr. is given a house and lot the former furnished. And our next grave, in fact, is the grave of Mrs. Pierre's daughter-in-law, just over here. I'm going to go to it now. And Valen will tell us about this grave. I'll have a close-up for you. And I'm sure many of you who know the history of the Black community in Victoria will understand why we're here. And I'll let Valen tell you all about it. <clears throat> in 1858, a number of Blacks from California emigrated to BC to escape unjust treatment. Among couples who arrived in BC were Thomas and Anne Pierre and Charles and Nancy Alexander. These families did not know each other in the USA, but, we, but were brought close together through marriage of the children. Thomas and Pierre had eight, sorry. Yes, Thomas and Anne Pierre had eight children. Cor Corinthia being the sixth child, and she was born here in Victoria on 7th of December, 1868. Charles and Nancy Alexander, on the other hand, had 12 children, Thomas being the fourth child, and was born also here, on, on 6 February, 
1859. Thomas Alexander and Corinthia Pierre were married on the 2nd of February, 1887, when Thomas was 28 and Corinthia nine year, 19 years old. Thomas and Corinthia had seven children between 1888 and 1907. These children and their descendants now represent six generations with at least 170 individuals. Thomas lived only to 67 years. He died on 11th July, 1926, and was buried at Shady Creek Cemetery. Thomas's father initiated and helped build the first Shady Creek Church and was one of its first preachers. The Alexander family therefore had a special connection to that cemetery. Corinthia lived to 71 years, dying on 1st March, 1939. She and her daughter Eva are buried here in her parents' plot. We continue to have historical connections to Corinthia and Thomas. The last son, Baton, was born in 1907 and died in 1981. He once lived at 1324 Balmoral Road in Victoria. In 2003, the house received heritage status. I knew one of Corinthians' grandsons, John Douglas Hudlin, and, and he contributed much to this historical data on Corinthia and Eva. Another well-known descendant is Karen Horschel, who has been one of the, we can say, uh, founding members of the Victoria of the British Columbia Black History Awareness Society. So we are still seeing the descendants of some of these early pioneers. Thank you, Valen. Okay. And we now aren't going very far. Um, I believe you're doing the next uh, okay. story. And in order to do that, that will be the story of Samuel Booth. Um, yes. I'm going to uh, perch myself in a more photogenic spot. Perhaps the, the tombstone for the Booth family, let me show you right now, is not particularly large and difficult to read. That's it right there. It's a small one. But let me show you why I want to find a different place. And maybe as we're perched behind the grave with all the daffodils and snowdrops blooming, mm -hmm. you, can tell us, you can tell us all about Sandy <coughs> Booth and his great exploits. Yes. Most of the Blacks who came to Victoria were not gold miners, but the discovery of gold near Souk which is a small town not far from Victoria, in 1864, caught the attention of some Blacks. Samuel Booth was one of four Black men who formed a company to mine gold at Leechtown in 1864. Booth found a gold nugget as big as a hen's egg. Booth and one of his partners, George Monroe, took the steamer from Souk to Victoria and displayed the nugget in the West Wells Fargo Company office for several days. 
Samuel Booth was one of the blacks who became a British subject in order to vote. He became quite prosperous. And in the 1880s, Grubbs ticked Henry McDame, who was prospecting for gold along the Seneca, Seneca River. Skeena River, that is. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. So Samuel Booth and the very important gold rush to Leechtown in 1864. And uh, there were many uh, black miners who took part in that. And one of them even uh, operated the Mount Ararat Hotel, which was a landmark in Leechtown. There's nothing left at Leechtown, unfortunately, but people still go there to pan for gold. I'm not sure that anyone has pulled out a, a nugget as large as Samuel Booth did the size of a hen's egg. And now we have just a few more stories. And what I'd like to do is to walk this way. We're going to leave the Methodist section. We'll just have one final look across the Methodist section here. It's a very large section and very picturesque in some ways, but we're going to cross one of the winding carriageways and walk through the area that was originally designated in 1873 as for general purposes. And that meant that the people buried here for various reasons were not going to be buried in the sections reserved for the religious denominations we've already talked about. And while we're walking this way, I'll also mention that not too far from here, I'll just point the camera that way, just down past the large tree that you can see was another section in the very remote and windswept southwestern corner of the cemetery. And in the map laid out when the cemetery was established, that section was reserved for Aboriginals and Mongolians, uh, as they were referred to at the time, at least on that map, uh, Indigenous and Chinese people. And Although if indigenous or Chinese people became Christians, then they had the right to be buried in the respective section of the cemetery. But if they were not Christians, then the section that I mentioned was reserved at the time for them. And as we walk this way, you can see a very large tree looming up. It's a pine tree, one of many beautiful pines in the cemetery. And in the original configuration of the cemetery in 1872 and 73, that marked the western boundary of the cemetery. There was a fence here and a stream not too far beyond it, running down to Ross Bay. And so this grave we're gonna be looking at next under the pine tree was right on the very edge of the cemetery. Beyond was the property of Sir James Douglas. And in the 1890s, the cemetery trustees purchased a portion of it from his estate in order to expand the cemetery. And our final grave, in fact, will be in that section. But right now, let's just look up into the limbs of the pine tree. And I just like to tell you that as we're looking up and up and up and up and up into the spreading limbs of this beautiful tree, this is all that remains of Charlie Kincaid. It's almost certain that Charlie never did have a tombstone. I'll explain why. Charlie was black. He was born in Texarkana, Texas. And although on this tour, we have talked about the very many uh, black people who led exemplary lives. And I think they're the, the stories we, we really do like to hear, especially as we commemorate Black History Month. It's also important to remember that black people like everybody else, were not all the same. And although some led exemplary lives, well, Charlie Kincaid wasn't one of them. Charlie Kincaid, it seems, was a womanizer. He left a number of women, apparently whom he'd married, behind in the places he went, in Minnesota, in Nelson, British Columbia, 
and eventually to other places. He ended up in Seattle in the late 1890s, and there Charlie met Belle Adams. Belle was white. She was a farmer's wife from near Seattle, but when her husband had gone to the gold rush, the Klondike gold rush of 1898, Belle decided she didn't really want to be a single mother looking after their son, and so she left her son with family members and headed to the waterfront district of Seattle. I'll leave the rest to your imagination, but suffice it to say, the gold rush was a big boom in Seattle, Vancouver, and Victoria, and Belle and Charlie came up here. Charlie had a job playing his piano in some of the saloons, notably the California Saloon on on Johnson Street, and Belle plied her trade along Johnson Street. And one day, some of the girls in one of the saloons told her that she'd better watch out. Charlie had been two-timing. And Charlie not only was two-timing, but he was bragging to everybody with an earshot that he, would, he was going to take his new girl to Vancouver and leave Belle here. Well, she'd see about that. And she headed to the room to have it out with Charlie he wasn't there, but when he did come back, there was a huge shouting match, not their first. They chased each other up and down the hall, and Belle later told the judge that it was self-defense. As Charlie lunged toward her to push her against the wall, she took her straight razor and lashed out at him. You see, it was the straight razor that Charlie had left on the sink earlier that night when he'd come in to shave. Well, she said she wasn't really trying to kill Charlie, but the knife went across his neck from ear to ear. The blood spurted across the room. She almost fainted, and that gave Charlie a few seconds to get out of the room, clutching his throat, but it was too late. Charlie bled to, to death as he fell down the stairs, and people pulled him out onto the sidewalk, and then Belle joined him, screaming as she came, Charlie, Charlie, don't die. I love you, Charlie. I didn't mean to do it. Please don't die. <laughs> well, indeed, uh, she admitted she'd done it, but the jury... And the judge agreed that it was really self-defense. And it was not first-degree murder, but manslaughter. And she was sent to Kingston Penitentiary for Women, where she served a five-year term. But poor Charlie, when the coroner picked up his remains and brought him here to a pauper's grave at Ross Bay Cemetery, this was Charlie's ignominious end. And... Well, pine trees don't last forever, as none of us do, but indeed, well, we can. Let's look up into the branches and think about Charlie and his rather unpleasant demise on Johnson Street back in the spring of 1898. Now, I think we have time for one more grave. And I see the sun has come out, so it's going to be a pleasant walk. And Val, and this is going to be your story, the final story. And we're now moving into a section. Let me turn the camera on it because it is so beautiful in the sunshine. You'll want to see it and not have a look at me. We're looking into the section that was acquired from the estate of Sir James Douglas in the 1890s. Memorial Crescent, for those that know uh, the city, is just in the distance and moss rocks looming up behind it. Many of the older sections that we've seen so far were full by the time this was purchased, and that's one of the reasons the city decided to acquire it, and also another section about the same size at the eastern side of the cemetery in the property that had once belonged to Isabella Ross, the first woman in B.C. that uh, had land registered in her own name. And starting in the early 1900s, this section started to fill up. Oh, and we have a visitor up here. Some of you might be able to see straight ahead. There's a, a deer oh, and joined by another one, of course. Uh, one of the features of Ross Bay Cemetery is the presence of a large number of deer. As anyone who has come to the cemetery will attest, or anyone who lives nearby who's trying to create a garden will understand that the deer are all over. And uh, we'll just have a look at this grave, which has nothing to do with black history as far as I know, but it has daffodils on it. The deer don't <laughs> like daffodils, but if these had been tulips, they would be gone by now. The tulips seem to appeal to the deer a great deal. 
So as we walk over here, we're coming to our final stop. And this is the grave of John Giscom. And John Giscom's grave is a very interesting one. And his story is particularly fascinating. Alan told us about Samuel Booth in the, in the uh, Leechtown Gold Rush. But John Giscom links to other gold rushes around that time. And here we are covered in moss. And underneath the stone right here, it's a little bit dirty right now, but there is white marble under there. And Valen, why don't you tell us about John Giscom? John Robert Giscom was born in 1832 in Jamaica, British West Indies. He worked in the 1850s building the railroad across the Isthmus of Panama and then went on to California. He appeared in Victoria with the California Black Migration of 1858-59. In 1862, Giscom set out from Quinell with his party, with his partner, Henry McDame, who was from the Bahamas, to prospect the Peace River County. They had intended to go up the Samson River, this Salmon River for its confluence with the Fraser, just north of Prince George. And over the Hudson's Bay Company's path trail to Fort McLeod on the shore of McLeod's Lake. But when they reached the Salmon River, it was running high and the indigenous guide suggested an alternate route. They continued up the Fraser, then walked another nine miles to Summit Lake. From there, they went along the Crook River and reached Fort McLeod in a short time. Apart from First Nations, they were the first to take this route. In the 1870s, that nine mile walk from Salmon River to Summit Lake came to be called Giscom Portage. It was well known among the miners and other travelers heading north into Omanika and Peace districts. It is an effective shortcut connecting navigable rivers on either side of the continental divide. And it is used today by canoeists traveling between the Arctic and Pacific watersheds. The two partners worked for a while in the Omanika and eventually got to the Cassia district. There in 1874, Henry McDain made an important strike on the tributary of the Dees River and John Giscom worked the claim with notable success for years. The creek on which Henry McDame found gold came to be called McDame Creek. And it is like the Goscom Potage became a relatively famous location and is often referred to in the literature of the area. After working the claim in the Cassia, Giscom and McDame parted company. Some reports suggest that Henry McDame, like many miners, was not able to hold on to his wealth, was 
John Iscombe was more fortunate. He retired to Victoria and invested his earnings in real estate. For the last 20 years or so of his life, he bought and sold property. And when he died, he left an estate valued at $21,000, the equivalent value today of John Giscombe's holding would be almost half a million dollars. John Giscombe himself is red, relatively unknown, but his name survives in the North. A town off the Yellowhead Highway was named Giscombe in 1911. Also named Giscombe a rapids and a canyon on the Fraser River. It is difficult to know exactly what kind of man John Robert Giscombe was. He died a childless bachelor at the age of 75 in 1907. And that's it, John. Thank you, Valen. You're welcome. <laughs> So I'm glad the weather has improved for us. I recall in past years when you and I have done this tour in person here in the cemetery, with usually a fairly large flock following us, it hasn't always been so pleasant. Windstorms, you know, lashing rain, even snow on occasion, but uh, more often than not, it's like this. Of course, we're in Victoria. So for those of you who aren't in Victoria, but might be uh, in places where it's a little bit colder, uh, this of course is a, a typical day in Victoria during the winter and spring flower count starts this coming week and I'm sure somebody will come to the cemetery and count all the, the blossoms. Let me just focus on one tree over there, a uh, tree in full bloom. There must be thousands and thousands of blooms. So if you're on the flower count, come and have a look. So yes. I think, I think uh, there, there may be some time for questions. And um, I think, uh, Fran, are, are you going to moderate the questions? Uh, yes. <laughs> You've been waiting patiently. <laughs> well, we, we do have one question, which is actually, well, it's a really interesting one. It's from uh, John Azar, who's saying, how complete is the record of burials of Black people in the various cemeteries in the area? Okay, I can probably answer that one. Uh, but uh, it, it's uh, complete, fairly complete for Ross Bay Cemetery. Of course, in the early records, uh, people's color was not mentioned necessarily in, in a couple of cases. Um, they were mentioned as black or Negro or colored or African, something of that sort. Uh, but uh, they didn't always. And so unless somebody was particularly well known, we don't always know if somebody was black. But we can piece together uh, several hundred people of black uh, who are black, uh, were black, who are buried at Ross Bay Cemetery. And uh, in the other cemeteries, Shady Creek is probably a good example that Valen mentioned, where the Alexander family and members of the Spots family are buried. I think the records are fairly complete because the descendants, the families are still looking after some of those graves, but um, it's probably difficult to understand exactly how many uh, black people are buried in other cemeteries because those specific records weren't kept. So if, if anyone is interested, and I'm sure this is something the Black History Awareness Society is, uh, uh, is interested in, in doing, maybe you've already done this, um, re recording the, the other uh, uh, black pioneers who are buried in other cemeteries in addition to the ones at Ross Bay, but we're still trying to think, figure out who is buried at Ross Bay as well. We don't have the identities of everybody here. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've had a couple of questions where people want to know if this is going to be recorded and if it's going to be available. Okay, the, um, the recording has been done and uh, Paul uh, Schachter with the BC Black History Awareness Society has been uh, lo looking after the, the technical side of this. Paul, is that something that you can answer? Yes, thanks. Um, the recording will be posted on the events page at bcblackhistory.ca and it should be
posted by tomorrow morning. Thanks. Great. And uh, I guess one, one last question uh, from a, a, another Paul. Who do you think buried in the ceremony would be, sorry, buried in the cemetery would be considered the most influential in the migration of black pioneers? Wow, that's, that's a, a difficult question. I think there are a couple that I can, I can mention. Um, probably the most influential of all is James Douglas. Yes. And uh, uh, be, was it because of his black ancestry? Was it because of his humanitarian ideals that he invited the blacks to come here from California? We don't know for sure, but we know it was Douglas who did invite them. Um, was it Jeremiah Nagel, who was the one who delivered his message and in the end uh, brought the first ones here on his boat, the Commodore? Or was it uh, people such as Mifflin Wistar Gibbs and his business partner, Peter Lester, uh, who were very early here and who set up businesses, uh, who generally prospered, but became informal leaders of the, the Black community? Um, many people would say probably that Mifflin Wistar Gibbs deserves uh, the, the biggest attention. Uh, because he, he did go back to the United States eventually, but um, he, he was very, very involved in the community when he was here. And um, I think he's the only one, well, James Douglas uh, is, is an exception, but he's the only one of the others that we've mentioned who actually has uh, merited a distinction as a national historic figure. Yes, did, um, did, did you mention that in... Uh, in a, in a new church, a new uh, library in Victoria that a reading room has been de dedicated to him. Ah, we didn't mention that, but that's, a, that's an excellent point. It's the Shuang Wang Tang uh, the James Bay branch of the Victoria Public Library. And uh, yes, there's a, a, a reading room named after uh, Mifflin Wistar Gibbs. So he's well recognized already by, by Victoria. That's right, yes. Um, he, by the way, when he went back to the States, he became a lawyer and he'd studied law in Victoria, but I don't know if he was ever, um, if he ever was admitted to the bar, but certainly in the States he was, and uh, he became the first uh, judge elected in the United States in Arkansas and later became an ambassador as well uh, yeah. for the United States. Okay. Are there any other questions, Fran? Uh, no, uh, but uh, just to note that there's uh, some teachers that are watching today and they're interested in having the uh, video available for their classroom. So that's, that's great. Uh, yes. <laughs> that's good. We want more people to know about this important topic. And uh, uh, for those that, that have tuned in today, perhaps for the first time, uh, the, the, the tours uh, jointly run by the BC Black History Awareness Society and the Old Cemetery Society for Black History Month have been going on for 25 years. Uh, we'll be back next year for sure. Uh, but in the meantime, the Old Cemetery Society does other tours as well every Sunday afternoon at two. Uh, they will be on Zoom for the first while, but when we can resume in-person tours, we will do so. The topics are different each week, but we always include uh, the Black History Tour um, in our roster for Black History Month in February. All right, I think we can call it a wrap. Thank you very much, John and Valen. Uh, I always learn something every year. Uh, it was not very long ago that I was actually looking for the grave site for Sidna Francis for a story we were doing about yeah. black pioneer women. So now I know where it is. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. And uh, thank you and uh, all the best to those that have been tuning in and uh, we'll see you again.